Today on Know the Truth from Philip DeCourcy. Marriage is not about self-fulfillment. Marriage is about the doing of God's will. As the two come together in marriage and join hearts, gifts, and passion to pursue the will of God. Together, partners, together they will stand taller, reach further, and do more. Marriage is under attack, but God's Word offers hope and strength. Today on Know the Truth, Philip reveals God's design for marriage in a world of cultural chaos. We'll uncover seven key purposes that make marriage more than just a social construct and learn how to stand strong against modern pressures. It's a lesson on reclaiming the sanctity and power of biblical marriage, and it's from the Life Together series, available at ktt.org. Here's Pastor Philip DeCourcy with a message in Ephesians 5 titled, Wedding Plans. Take your Bible and turn to Ephesians 5, 22 to 23. We're in a series on the book of Ephesians, Life Together, because one of the great themes of Ephesians is unity. I'm going to begin a two-part sermon, simply an overview of Ephesians 5, 22 to 33 in terms of God's purposes for marriage. Starting today, we're looking at what I call wedding plans. What's God's wedding plans for your wedding? for your marriage? What's God's purpose for the institution of marriage? Ephesians 5 is kind of a Christian version of what they called household codes. If you read about the culture then, either Hellenistic Judaism or Roman culture, there were these household codes, rules, on how a house ought to be governed and a marriage established. And I think what we've got here is a Christian version of that. I don't think that Paul borrowed a lot from the outside. This is a gospel-centered, biblically-defined understanding of marriage. And we'll see here that one of the great purposes of marriage is a portrayal of the gospel. Look at verse 32 of Ephesians 5. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. That's one of the purposes of marriage. Your love for each other is to be a reflection of a greater love, one that started in eternity past between Christ and His people. In chapter 1, we learned about election and adoption and redemption, and how that before time began in eternity past, God betrothed a people to His Son, and His Son purchased that people in His death upon a cross. Hebrews 13, verse 4, it says something very interesting. Marriage is honorable among all men and the bed undefiled. Marriage is a creation ordinance for all of mankind. It's not a Christian ordinance. It's a creation ordinance. We want what this passage teaches for all men and all women and all nations. Now, doing the will of God in the immediate context meant obeying the command to be filled by the Spirit. And if you're filled by the Spirit, we saw there are several marks to that, and one of those is submission. Verse 21 tells us what? Submitting to one another in the fear of God. That's submitting to one another in terms of the authority figures that God puts over us. Could be government, could be one's husband, could be one's parents, could be one's pastor. We're to submit to that. That's one of the fruits of the Spirit. And being filled by the Spirit is one of the aspects of God's will for our life. So that's where we're at. So we're going to look at God's purposes for marriage. You're born to live your created purpose. And for most of us, that will be marriage. And if God purposes marriage, I want to know His purposes for marriage. Now, one more thing before we get there. Tragically, we're watching and witnessing 
the deconstruction and the destruction of the first and foremost institution in God's creation, marriage, in our day and in our generation. Can I just underscore the importance of the home? It is the first institution from which all other institutions come. It's the baseline. It's the datum line. Think about this. The earliest education was done in the home. In fact, as I was studying this week, I was flabbergasted to learn that when same-sex marriage was being argued in the Supreme Court before its establishment, Chief Justice Roberts reports that the lawyers who petitioned in favor for same-sex marriage conceded they were, quote, not aware of any society that has permitted same-sex marriage before 2001. You need to hear that again. The guys and the girls that argued for same-sex marriage in the Supreme Court acknowledged that no society ever codified it, ever embraced it in law before 2001. Folks, we're in uncharted territory. We're in the twilight zone. We're going back, words fast, to a very dark place. That's why the light of God's Word, that's why this passage is so critical. Now, again, by way of introduction, a little longer than normal, but I want to get this in. Let's just take in where we're at and what's going on all around us. We are watching, we are witnessing the destruction of marriage, and it's tragic. But I want to add something else. It's satanic. It's satanic. It's tragic. It's bizarre. It's sad. It's evil. Do you know how the devil is described in John 10, verse 10? As one who likes to come and steal, kill, and destroy. He's a destroyer. He's a waster. Revelation 9, verse 11 tells us that he is Apollyon, the destroyer. I want to tell you this. The stench of hell hangs over all that is taking place within our society in the demolition of the home and the remaking of marriage. The devil cheers when homes are ruined, and hell celebrates when homes are ruined. The devil fights to make families feeble. Why? (laughs) Because God has put a premium on the home. And what God builds, He loves to destroy. Think about this. The home is the building block of society. In a God-ordered society, a heaven-blessed community. The family is the first institution, and it's treated with respect and priority. The family is a bulwark of authority. It's where law and order is established. It's where children learn authority and obedience. And when they do it at home, they'll do it in school. They'll do it on the street. They'll do it in the company of a police officer. It's the incubator of godliness. Malachi 2 tells us that God wants us by His grace and with His help to raise godly seed. If we're going to disciple the nations, begin with your own child in this nation. Ephesians 6, 1 to 4, we'll see it in a few weeks. We're to bring up our children in the fear and admonition of the Lord. The home is a nursery of leadership. What does 1 Timothy 3 teach us? That if a man doesn't order his home, if a man can't take care of his home, he's not worthy to lead the church. Leadership among men is fashioned in the home. That's the measurement of a man's leadership for a good part and for good reason. The home is a school of masculinity and femininity. God created them male and female. And a man is meant to model masculinity. And a woman is meant to model femininity and motherhood to her children. And then lastly, we see it here. Our marriages are a picture of the gospel. Husbands, love your wives because Christ loves His bride. He died for her. He gave Himself up for her. And if you're a bride, won't you submit to Christ and your husband 
who's modeling himself after Christ because, you know what? He's bought us and we're not our own. But you get the point. As you and I live out these God-given roles, these distinct callings, we portray the gospel and we remind people that before there was a marriage between a man and a woman, there was a marriage between Christ and his bride, the church. In fact, every one of our marriages points to something beyond it and something that will outlast it. We'll get to that. John Piper's idea, the momentary marriage. Satan is hard at work. Satan got between Adam and Eve and sought to separate them from God, Genesis 3, 1 to 7. In the context of marriage and family life here, Paul says, look, you need to be filled with the Spirit so that you can submit as a wife, so that you can lovingly lead as a husband, because the devil works against you. You get to that in Ephesians 6, verses 10 to 18, where we've got to put on armor if we're going to stand in the evil day. If you go to 1 Corinthians 7, 1 to 7, Paul talks about intimacy sexually between a husband and wife and, and the need for that to be regular and authentic and healthy. He says, should a husband and wife decide to not engage in that intimacy for a period of time with consent from one another, he recommends that that period of time, maybe for the purpose of fasting or seeking God in a more intense way, that it not be long because Satan will tempt. The only reason I go to that passage as I did the others is to show that in passages related to marriage, Satan is around the edges, seeking to angle his way in. I remember a pastor in Belfast telling of a doctor in his church who was doing the rounds in a hospital in Belfast and engaging one of his patients. He learned that the patient was fasting and praying. And when he asked him if he was a Christian, assuming, given the fact that he was fasting and praying, the man replied, no, I'm a Satanist. And I'm fasting and praying for the destruction of Christian homes. It's real. That's why Nehemiah 4 verse 14 is not a bad verse, although it is to do with a physical building and a historic situation. We can apply it secondarily to the idea Nehemiah says to the Israelites, fight for your family, for your wives, and for your children. So all of that said, what we're going to do now is go through these seven purposes. God's wedding plans for our wedding We're going to trace over several principles, uh, both in this passage and in other passages, so that we might marry God's purposes within our marriage. When I was at the Master's Seminary, I I remember a class by Dr. Wayne Mack, who was a wonderful biblical counselor. And then uh, he, he told a story about a young seminarian who was in a class on pastoral theology, and that included how to lead a funeral and how to officiate at a wedding. And as the teacher went through what you ought to do, this young seminarian put his hand up and says, I'm gonna, I live in fear of doing that someday. I'm, I'm a bit of a nervous type, and realizing the solemnity of a funeral and the, the celebration of a marriage, I fear of, that I'll mess up and spoil it all, you know? And the professor said, well, we're, we're all capable of that. And, and here's what I would say. Should you lose your way a little bit, best thing to do is just catch your breath, Try and get back to where you were, and maybe in the in-between, just quote a scripture. It's never wrong to quote a scripture. And so he does his first wedding out of school, and part his way through, and he loses his way. And he's beginning to sweat a little bit under the collar, and then he remembers what the professor said, and so he decided to quote a scripture. And in front of the couple that were getting married, in front of the congregation, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. (laughs) That's probably not a good scripture for that occasion. But when Mac reminded us, is that not true of so many when it comes to marriage? They don't know what they're doing. We live in a culture that doesn't even know what it is. It's anything you want it to be. No. It's what God has determined it to be. So let's go through these. I'll give you the outline up front. Partnership. Prosperity. Procreation, pleasure, protection, piety, picture. 
Those are the seven purposes. Now, just tracing over Ephesians 5 and 6, you've got those. You've got the, the two becoming one. There's partnership. You've got the pleasure of intimacy in becoming one and the nourishing and the cherishing of one another. You've got procreation in the bearing of children. You've got prosperity in that if the child obeys their parents and does the will of God, there's a promise attached to that. It will be well with them. Family life brings prosperity and wellness, and then you've got picture. This whole thing's a mystery. In fact, your marriage points to another marriage, greater, eternal. But let's pick the first two, partnership and prosperity. One of the purposes of God in marriage is partnership. Two persons, a man and a woman, becoming one in complementary unity for the purpose of strengthening each other and serving God. That's what the partnership's about. The husband and wife coming together in a covenant relationship that they might strengthen one another, support each other, and serve the purposes of God within creation. And in Proverbs 2.17, a wife is described as the companion of of my youth. There's the word companion, partner, friend. In Song of Solomon chapter 5, verse 16, the wife is described as a friend to her husband. Love that. But this is best seen back in Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2, all good theology begins in Genesis. And in verses 15 to 25, we have the creation of Adam. We have the establishment of marriage. We have the promise of children. Now, initially, Adam had animals for companions. And you know what? As we've said, you know, a dog can be a man's best friend. But let's be honest. As good as animals are, and as, as much fun as we have with some of our pets, it's not enough. Let me remind you, I hope it's not enough. You were made for something more than, you know, pooch. So here's Adam with the animals as companions, but it's not enough. In fact, Adam names the animals if you read the passage. And he goes, there's Mr. Hippo and Mrs. Hippo. And he works his way down the line and in a day, there he stands all by himself, and God looks at Adam by himself. Chapter 2, verse 18, and the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper, suitable, comparable, complementary to him. The word there in the Hebrew and comparable or suitable is opposite to or comparable to. And the woman was a match for the man biologically. The woman was a match for the man in terms of what she brought in complementary gifts. In one sense, they're the same. In another sense, they're not the same. Biologically, calling, contribution. But one of the great blessings of marriage is friendship. It's not good that man should be alone. So God gave Adam a helper, someone comparable to him, complementary to him. And then we have the establishment of marriage by God. Marriage is God's idea, verse 24, quoted by Paul in Ephesians 5. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, leaving, cleaving, you know what, and weaving. That's what's going on here. Now, it shouldn't surprise us that God would say about Adam that it's not good that man stands there alone, because man was made in God's image. You go back to Genesis 1.26, God said, let us make man, notice the plural, in our image, or let us make man, seems to be a hint at the triunity of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Man was made in the image of God, and God exists in relationship. You know that? I mean, the doctrine of the Trinity is a mystery, but it's a reality. And we know that there are three persons in the one God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and they live in community with each other, co-essential, co-equal, co-eternal. Now, man was made in the image of God. Man was made to be relational. And I think that's 
somewhere at the heart of Genesis 2.18, it's not good that man should be alone. We're not alone. We can't leave him alone. And so God made Adam a helper comparable to him. And woman came from man. And it's part of our human DNA that we desire companionship. We're more fully human in the company of others. That's one of the beautiful things about marriage, where you get to enjoy someone in intimacy for a lifetime as it deepens and broadens. Yes, Ecclesiastes 4, 9 to 12 is right. Two is better than one. You see, isolation, aloneness cuts across the grain of the human being. Now, I just rewatched Castaway with Tom Hanks. Remember that story? Uh, he's a FedEx troubleshooter and he's traveling the world fixing things for that company. And, and the plane goes down somewhere over the Pacific. He's doing a survivor. He lands on an island all by himself until he's eventually rescued. And one of the days, a, a, a football bobs up onto the shore from the wreckage, and, and he takes the football, and we know he kind of draws a face on it, and he names the football what? Wilson. And him and Wilson live on the island together until he's rescued. Now, you know, we, there's not much companionship in a football, but even that was symbolic about the fact that he needed someone to interact with, this imaginary person. And that's what's going on here. Now, here's another thing. I think this is important. If you look at the fuller context of Genesis 2 and the creation mandate, it suggests that Eve was given to Adam as a helper for more than simple friendship, more than simple companionship. She was to be his companion in the fulfillment of God's stated will for him as a man and for mankind as a whole. Go back to Genesis 1 verse 28, and you'll read these words. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. There's a verse that should help you interpret your environmentalism. Man's dominion over the earth. But the point is this. Man and woman were called to be fruitful, fill the earth, subdue, exercise dominion, create community, make discovery, bring about advancement. May we embrace that responsibility with joy and intention. You're listening to Know the Truth, a message from Philip DeCourcy titled Wedding Plans. To replay today's lesson, visit our message archive online at ktt.org or on the KTT app or podcast. Today's message was from the Life Together series, a study in the book of Ephesians. It's our hope that this study will mold and transform your understanding of our unity in Christ. So, to complement Pastor Philip's teachings and aid in this goal, we're offering you the CSB Life Council Bible. This resource equips you with biblical truth on relationships, marriage, and parenting, featuring insights from over 150 Christian scholars. As you've been blessed by our ministry, we invite you to partner with us. Your generous gift of any amount goes far beyond receiving a resource. It helps fulfill Christ's command by participating in the Great Commission and helping others experience the joy of the gospel. To give your gift today and receive your copy of the CSB Life Council Bible, call 888 888- 644-8811 or give online at ktt.org. You can also write to us at Know the Truth, Post Office Box 30250, Anaheim Hills, California, 92809. Well, this is Wayne Shepherd signing off, but join us tomorrow when we'll continue the message titled Wedding Plans. We're learning more about God's powerful purpose for marriage Friday on Know the Truth. Today's program was produced and sponsored by Know the Truth Incorporated. Jesus said, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free.